Hi, I'm Elaine Mills with Master Gardeners of Northern Virginia, here today to talk about an invasive plant, Japanese barberry. The characteristics of invasiveness were outlined in Executive Order 13112, signed by President Clinton in 1999 and further amended by President Obama. That order states that an invasive plant is one that is not native to the area in which it is growing. It can escape cultivation into our natural areas, and when it does, it can cause harm either to human health, the economy, or the environment. Right. Japanese barberry meets all the qualifications of invasiveness. It's a non-native plant that was introduced to the United States in 1875 for use in hedgerows, and it's still extremely popular for landscaping in both commercial and residential settings. As early as 1910, it was observed escaping from cultivation into natural areas, and it currently poses a threat from New England all the way to North Carolina. The invasive spread occurs when birds consume the fruit and then spread the seeds into natural areas. There, it will form impenetrable hedges, suppressing the growth of native woodland wildflowers and shrubs. Barberry has a, a competitive advantage over these native understory species. First, because it leaves out earlier than they do in the spring. And additionally, its thorny branches uh, are not consumed by deer. An additional concern, both in our forests and our home gardens, is that barberry is the perfect breeding ground for both mice and the deer ticks that are responsible for the spread of Lyme disease. Luckily, there are a number of native shrubs that make excellent replacements for invasive Japanese barberry. One excellent example is with me here, it's common nine bark, Physocarpus apulifolius, a multi-stemmed shrub with a similar arching habit. This is a very resilient plant, tolerant of dry, rocky soil and drought, and also fairly resistant to deer predation. It will be covered with abundant blooms in the spring. These are the resulting seed heads. The blooms are beautiful domed clusters of white petals, and they will be very attractive to bees and butterflies. The seed heads that you're seeing now here in June will continue to turn a darker color, very attractive as an ornamental feature, and the seeds will be eaten by birds. The lobed leaves of this plant are also beneficial for our insects. They serve as food for the caterpillar stage of several moths. One feature that you can't see at the moment will show up in the winter time when the leaves of the plant drop. Nine bark gets its name because of its exfoliating bark, which is said to peel away in nine layers. Common nine bark is a fairly tall plant. It can range from six to nine feet tall and wide, but that makes it perfect for use as a screening plant, as a hedge, or as you see here in my garden, an anchor plant for my large pollinator bed. There are many different cultivars of nine bark in the horticulture trade. Some have been modified for height and have a fairly short dwarf form, and others have been modified for their foliage color. The color, of course, is very attractive for us. It can range from golden to orange, as you see here, this kind of coppery color. This particular cultivar is Coppertina. There are others that have a purple or a burgundy foliage. As I say, they're attractive for us, but the change in the leaf color means a change in the leaf chemistry. And be alert that these plants will no longer be able to serve as larval host plants for our Lepidoptera. The second native shrub that I'd like to recommend is buttonbush, Cephalanthus occidentalis. This is a fast growing shrub with a rounded habit that can reach six to 10 feet high and wide. It can grow in a range of sun exposures, but does best when it has a little more sun for good flowering and fruiting. 
the outstanding characteristic of this plant is these lovely flowers. They're tubular in shape, fragrant, and clustered very densely into this sphere. If you're interested in attracting butterflies and hummingbirds, this would be a wonderful addition to your garden. And because this plant grows well in moist to wet soil, you could also use it in a rain garden or bordering streams or ponds. The flowers will eventually form seed heads with little nutlets that are enjoyed by birds. And these will form a dark brown and be an interesting feature on into the winter months. Additionally, the plant can provide support because its foliage is consumed by the caterpillars of several species of moths. If the first two shrubs I've described are too large for you, you may want to consider Ilex opaca Maryland dwarf, a female cultivar of our American holly tree. This particular specimen planted here is fairly young, but eventually it will grow to about two to three feet in height and can spread about five to 10 feet, making a really nice barrier plant or ground cover. It has glossy leaves with minimal thorns on it. And in the spring, it will have white flowers providing nectar for bees. You'll want to cite this plant carefully. It will need protection from strong afternoon sun in hot summer weather. The foliage will not be as dense when it's planted in deep shade. A third important thing to know about this plant is that it is dioecious. As I mentioned before, it is a female cultivar. And if you want to make sure that the plant bears fruit, the characteristic holly berries, you'll want to have what is referred to as a male pollinator. And any of the trees behind me could serve as a male pollinator. Some nurseries highly recommend Jersey Knight as that pollinator. Whichever native shrub you choose to replace invasive Japanese barberry, I wish you happy gardening.